Hello everyone welcome to my bold and beautiful now channel. As always, this time I have appeared with the mysterious soap opera. So don't delay like and subscribe now and stay tuned. Luna sits down for a delicate talk with R.J. In the design office, Zen told Luna that, no matter how R.J. replied when she confessed, Zen would always be there for her. She appreciated it and did not condemn him for what had happened between them. He replied that no one could have known that she would been told by the mints. Luna said the last thing she would anticipated had been to get involved with two inconceivable men and bring drama to their family. Zend asked Luna not to worry about it, but Luna did not want to disrupt their family consinity. She was sorry about having to do it, but she could not live that way presently. Zend indicated that he and R.J. would always be relatives, and Zend expressed concern for her. Luna replied that flat-out lying was not her. Zen did not believe she would designedly hurt anyone, and she replied that he wouldn't, moreover. Zen stated that she should do what she demanded to do to get peace, and he agreed that R.J. merited to know about that night. Latterly, Zen was alone, allowing about that night, when Carter arrived. Noting that Zen sounded distracted, Carter joked that Zen demanded to get it together because he was the new lead developer, mentoring R.J. and Luna. Carter assured Zen that he'd it, he would groan, and he'd picked up a lot from Hope and Thomas. Zen said it was not that. Carter stated that he knew Zen, who'd been off his game and detracted. Carter asked what was going on. Zen decided that he indeed demanded someone to talk to. It's about Luna, Zend revealed. In Eric's office, Steffi was impressed by R.J.S. sketch and felt he would come a long way. He claimed he would just been intruding around, but she saw a chance for him in Thomas's absence. R.J. replied that he, Luna, and Zend had met with hope about stepping up and would work well together. Ridge arrived ASR.J. Was asking how Steffi was holding up and mentioning how weird it had been for Cleric to hold a keepsake. R.J. entered a communication saying Luna wanted to meet him at his place to talk. R.J. took off and Ridge asked what Deacon had been allowing. Ridge called Sheila and Deacon's relationship a fling and was puzzled that Deacon allowed. They'd been in love. Steffi mugged. How did I not get invited to this? It hurts me to the core, Ridge joked. He got why Hope had gone, but wondered what Finn had gotten out of it and why Finn had had to say farewell to the person who'd been after Steffi for months. Steffi replied that she did not want Finn to begrudge her. Ridge asked what Finn would begrudge her for, and she stated that she would kill his birth mama. As far as Ridge was concerned, Sheila had had it coming, and Finn should be supporting his woman. At the sand house, Luna let herself in with the spare key. R.J. arrived with flowers for Luna. R.J. was glad she would wanted to get down to talk. They spoke about the great recollections they'd made in that house, and he decided that they demanded to make it a point to spend further time together. He tried to kiss her, but when she was not into it, he asked her what was wrong. Noted that Luna had not been herself. One nanosecond, she was vibing with him, and the coming, it sounded she would drift it off. He wondered if he was the problem, but she said he had not done anything wrong. Next, he guessed it was her mama, and she replied that her mama was part of it. Derived that Luna had been distant since Eric's party and marriage. Luna apologized. R.J. said she had no reason to, but she claimed that she did. He asked her to tell him what it was. At I.L. Giardino, Finn tried to tell Deacon that, in his grief, he would see what he would wanted to see at the crematorium. Deacon claimed that it was not about grieving, but he would see her face and also he would see ten toes. Finn concluded that Deacon's mind had played tricks on him. Cleric figured he might be as crazy as Sheila had been, but he might also be right. What if I did see ten toes? What if your mama s alive? Cleric asked. Finn tried to tell Deacon that the brain had a way of guarding one from trauma, but Deacon did not want to hear all the croaker stuff. Deacon supplicated Finn to, as Sheila's son, hear to Deacon. What if we did not lose her? Deacon asked. Finn asked where Sheila was and why she had not reached out to them. 
You saw her face, Finn stated and added that her body had been linked by multiple people. Tell me where that redundant toe came from. Deacon persisted. Finn called it wishful thinking and advised that going there would only hurt more. Finn prompted Deacon to accept the fact that he wouldn't see Sheila again. Latterly, Cleric was alone, talking to Sheila's picture and wondering how he would break it. Ridge arrived. Not moment, please, Cleric said. Deacon asked why Ridge was there. Ridge participated that his son was having a tough time after having to put down Sheila. Ridge inquired about the keepsake. Deacon said it was not Ridge's business, but Ridge claimed that, as a friend, he wanted to say it had been a big waste of time and plutocrat. Deacon replied that it had been his time and plutocrat. Ridge maintained that Sheila being gone was good for everyone. Deacon questioned whether Sheila really was gone. Back at Forrester, Finn arrived, ready to take his woman. Also and there. Steffi reminded him that they were in her office. Steffi guessed Deacon had wanted to give Sheila's ashes to Finn. Finn remarked that Deacon was losing it and saying crazy stuff about Sheila. Steffi came glib about Deacon's passions for Sheila until Finn revealed that Deacon had induced himself that Sheila might still be alive. 